thank you for your love and support. Um, as many of you know, this has been a long journey um, and not one that I really thought I would ever see myself on. Um, but I am super excited for what I feel like God has done in me, and I am just praying to be faithful for whatever these gifts are and however he wants them to be used. So today is going to look a little different, as you can imagine. Um, I have a story. Um, I have scriptures that we're going to go through, and I actually have an excerpt from a sermon that was preached over 1,600 years ago, and it still applies today. And I just want you to know that my prayer for you today is that you feel strengthened and encouraged on the journey that you are on. And the beautiful thing is, our journeys all look different, and yet the promises of God are for all of us, although they'll look different on how they are expressed. So the story that recently happened that I'm gonna be sharing happened in our daughter Chloe's life, and she's given me permission to um, share this. But before I tell you the story, I just want to set this up a little bit. And I have multiple scriptures that we're going to use. Um, one of the things that I have loved and have grown so much with Tim's teaching is that he will take a passage of scripture and we just kind of sit there, right? And we, we learn about history and the Greek words or the Hebrew words and we just do a little bit of a dive into that scripture. And that's an amazing way of really understanding and studying scripture. Today, with my story, we're going to have a lot of scriptures. And I know that sometimes can be difficult. Um, I've tried to put most of them up on the PowerPoint. And so I would just encourage you to write down the references and maybe go back. Because as much of this message is here, I feel like there's a rest of a story that God's gonna be speaking to you. I'm gonna share what he gave me, but I really believe that the Holy Spirit of God is going to speak to any who wants him to, and he's gonna continue and give you the rest of the story. So I wanna start with the very first scripture, um, and it's in John 10.10, 10, and Jesus is saying these words. And he says, the thief comes only to steal to kill and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. And friends, what I wanna unpack today is there's a line that has been drawn, and we do have an enemy of our soul who is on one side, who is wanting to steal and kill and destroy all of the good that I believe Jesus Christ has for us. And Jesus is on the other side, and he is the lover of our soul. And he has all kinds of provision and peace and goodness in the midst of all of life. So this fight is going on. And we've heard often, and, and if you've had any kind of aspect with church, you know that there's this fight for humanity and souls, and, and that as you come to Jesus and you confess him being Lord over your life and accept him into your heart, you start on this path, but there still is a war happening. There still is a battle going on for the way you live, for your attitudes, for the choices that you make. There still is a pull for all of us. It's an ongoing battle, and it's also the way we endure hardships and suffering. Salvation in Jesus does not mean that you will not have difficulty. It does not mean that you will not know loss. It does not mean a health, wealth, and prosperity is just going to be yours for the rest of your life. And honestly, I feel the church in America has done a very big disservice 
because we have not taught each other how to endure suffering, how to suffer well. And there is pain, there is trauma, and there are trials. Jesus even told us in John 16, 33, I have told you all of this so that you will have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. That's the gift that we have. Not that we escape difficulty, but that Jesus walks us through it and he never leaves us. And there is a way that we can walk through our difficulties. Paul tells us in Ephesians 6, 12, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, although honestly, sometimes we feel like it, right? But against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Now, depending on your background, you may never really have thought of the enemy of your soul. You may never really have thought of the devil. You may not want to think of him. But let me just tell you, he hates you, and he is real. And there are unseen forces in dark it's, it's the trauma and the wickedness of this world. As a follower of Jesus Christ, that's who I'm speaking to today. If you are a follower of Jesus, there is a wrestling that we all endure. And my question is, are you even aware? Are you alert to it? So here's some scriptures. 1 Peter 5, 8 tells us to stay alert, to watch out. For your great enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. 1 Thessalonians 5, 6 says, so be on your guard and not asleep like the others. Stay alert and be clear-headed. And Ephesians 6, verse 18 says, pray in the spirit at all times. And on every occasion, stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. So before I get into the story, I have two kind of disclaimers. The first is from my own experience. Please don't hear what I'm going to share and think that, and, and I'm saying this from my own experience, I'm kind of grown through some of these things. I am not saying that the devil is behind every hardship that you endure. I am not saying to go cast out devils every single, like every bush you see or whatever. That's not what I am saying. But I'm saying to stay alert that there is darkness that is pushing. But here's what I have seen in my own life. My own attitudes, my own choices, my own thoughts, can leave me in pits where he doesn't even have to do anything because I'm just doing the damage myself by my own choices. And so I make it easy because I don't follow truth. And I allow my own thoughts and my own offenses and the, whatever it is that's in me does enough damage. But here is the other side of that. I am a lover of Jesus, and I am endeavoring to follow him in every area of my life, and that makes me hated. And if that's what you are doing, you are hated. That's what the word tells us. And this is what I want us to unpack today. Any gift that God has given us, any provision that he has, all of the goodness that he has, is trying to be stolen, is trying to be killed out or destroyed in any way possible. I also want to be sure that you understand that as people of faith in Jesus Christ, having hardships does not mean that you do not have enough faith. Please stop saying that to each other. It is the most destructive thing our brothers and sisters in Christ can say to each other. Just have more faith. Just have more faith and you'll get what you want. 
That is not scriptural. It is not scriptural. And please stop saying that to each other because there is nothing more destructive when you're asking God for healing and it doesn't happen. Or you're asking God for some type of deliverance of something that has been so hard and it doesn't happen and someone says that to you, it makes you feel like it's all your fault. And that's a lie from the pit of hell. And I don't want us to go off on that aspect. Acts 14, 22 tells us that there's a word there that says we must endure sufferings. And that word actually means it's inevitable. If you are a human, it is inevitable that you are going to have hardships. And I'm setting all of this up because I don't want anybody to walk out of here with any kind of, I am causing hardships and trials in my life, when maybe it is, in fact, the enemy of your soul that hates you. So I learned a phrase several years ago, and I love this, and it says, learn how to endure suffering well. This, I believe, is a strategy for how we will actually reflect Jesus to people around us. Because even though all hell might be breaking out around us, we keep our eyes fixed on him. He is our hope. Didn't we just sing about his hope, his faithfulness? This is depending on him. My last caution before we start, and now you'll see why I'm doing all of this, kind of setting it up. If you cannot abide snakes... I have four slides that have snakes, has a snake. Three of them is a video clip, about 15 seconds long. And honestly, I don't want to like traumatize anybody. So if you don't even like to look at that, there are some animals that I just don't even want to see. My son loves putting them in front of me. Um, there are some that I just can't even handle. And if you are one of them with the snake, I, I have it set up so that I have a blank slide so that we're going to say, shut your eyes. Um, but I have three videos, and then I have a still shot towards the end. I promise it's not going to just show up on the screen without giving you a heads up so you are invited to shut your eyes. But we are going to look at the first video in one moment. Um, it was sent to our family by my daughter, Chloe, who lives in southern Georgia, um, and it was sent to our family text on September 29th. So let's go ahead and play the first video and shut your eyes if you don't want to see a snake. I don't know if you heard Chloe say, what's going on, as she casually walked into her bedroom. Um, she came home and found this snake in her bedroom. Um, yeah, thank you for going to the next slide so people don't have to deal with that. Um, she wasn't too stressed, and there are other animals for herself that cause her more stress when she sees them. But she went into the kitchen. She sent her family the video. She was doing a few things. I get the video and immediately call. And, and I was just like, Chloe, you've got to find, you know, and, and just kind of all, you know, hyper. And she was just like, Mom, I got to. And she goes, she's on the phone with me, goes back into her room. She's like, oh, I can't talk now. I've got to find that. Now I lost the snake. Now I lost the snake. And I'm like, this is your bedroom. Like, you need to have some intentional aspect of finding this snake. Um, so I was a little hyper with this. So she has to get off the phone, right? And so the next video that comes, I'm going to give you just an understanding. We're not quite there yet. I'm going to set this up because we had to look at it a, a few times. You are going to find Chloe. She has now found the snake. And it is in her bed frame. And
And what does she do? She grabs her lacrosse stick. I guess to catch it? I'm not quite sure. Um, so she's like messing with this snake. And you are going to hear her begin to escalate. And there is some fear and a laugh that I have never heard from my daughter before. Um, and so it, all of a sudden, this scenario gets a little bit intense. So I invite you to shut your eyes if you don't want to see this. Let's go ahead and play this. <laughs> now, just look at that snake right there. Like, right? Okay, you can go to the next thing so people can open their eyes if they want. All right, so, like, that snake definitely was in fighting mode, right? Well, let's not keep the suspense. Let's go ahead and just play this third video. It's eight seconds. So there's the snake. Um, basically, you, you couldn't really hear, but that is her landlord, for which this mama is very thankful. Um, help comes, and the landlord comes in. He sees where, you know, she's got the, she's trying to catch the snake with the lacrosse stick. He says, I'll be right back. He goes, and for us northerners, we, like, use these in our kitchen. Um, for kitchen tongs, but I guess in southern Georgia, they use them, ca snake catching tools. Um, and so that's what he went and grabbed from his wife's kitchen <laughs> and came back in to, um, to catch it. He catches it, and so then he proceeded, and you couldn't really hear, but he proceeded to give her a lesson and said, do you see this triangle right here? This is a baby copperhead. This mama, again, is very thankful that he got this out of my daughter's bed frame. And so, Chloe got a lesson in snakes that day. Um, we understand now that baby copperheads are just as venomous as adults. Um, and so, again, we are thanking Jesus for this. Okay, so now let's come to Maryland. Here I am, our family gets all of these texts and we're like, whoa, you know, thank Jesus for protection, whatever, and we go on. The next morning, I am having just my morning quiet time. Um, I was working through a book, reading devotional classics, and I came across John Chrysostom. He lived from 345 to 407. And he has a sermon called Dead to Sin. And part of the excerpt that I want to share with you is specifically entitled A Serpent Nestling in Our Bed. The day after this caught my attention. Listen to this original sermon, which can I just tell you, like 1,600 years, guys, Christianity is not some new thing that we don't need people telling us, well, this is what's wrong, and this is what doesn't work, and no, it's not. People, for over thousands of years, we have people that have been reading the word and preaching the word and spreading the good news, and people have been saying, yes, I want Jesus, and have been learning to live a different way. Do not let anyone around you tell you that what you are standing on when you are standing on the word of God is no longer relevant for today. It is another lie from the pit of hell, and unless you know your word, and unless you look at what has already been spoken, you will fall for whatever is being fed to you that floats your boat for the moment. I don't want my boat to be floated for a moment. I want to stand on the solid word of Jesus Christ, and I know that will see me through no matter what is happening in my own life. So that's what has been happening. Here's what I read. And I just want to read these couple of paragraphs from a sermon 1,600 years ago that still applies today. 
We should keep our mind fixed on one point only, how we may use what is best with the resources we have been given. If we do this, not even the devil himself will get the better of us. We must remember that we deal with a crafty enemy. If we were suddenly aware of a serpent nesting in our bed, we would go to great lengths to kill it. But when the devil nestles in our soul, we tell ourselves we are in no danger and that we then lie at ease. Why? Because we do not see him and his intent with our mortal eyes. This is why we must rouse ourselves and be more sober or alert. Fighting the enemy we can see makes it easy to be on our guard, but one that cannot be seen, we will not easily escape. Also, know that the enemy has no desire for open combat, for he would surely be defeated, but rather under the appearance of friendship, intends to insinuate his venom in to us with malice. Be on your guard and arm yourself with weapons of the Spirit. Be, become acquainted with the devil's plans that you may keep from getting caught in his traps and instead expose him. What a reminder. I journaled about this. I connected it to what Chloe had just gone through. I sent a text out to the family and was like, you're not going to believe this. Um, and so all of this was happening. Meanwhile, let's go back to Georgia, to Chloe. After all this happened, what followed for Chloe was a heavy oppression. She started having some really difficult days in multiple areas of her life. And it went on, unbeknownst to us, for weeks. And looking back, she feels like she really sees, after the snake incident, like it was like this, this thing just kind of settled over her. And she had gone to a community group in her church. And as they were going around just asking people to share, and um, she felt really stupid asking for prayer. She was just like, you know, this is kind of dumb, but I had this situation and the snake, and, and now it's like I've just got all of this, whatever. The people prayed, and something broke spiritually. Not that everything was taken care of and everything got really easy for her, but she felt something shift spiritually. And I believe what she felt was the body doing what the body is supposed to do and strengthen and encourage her and say, you are not alone. You are not alone. Can I just give a plug for small groups here? We're talking about strategies, friends. There is, like, coming to church, being involved in the church has been my entire life. The places that I am known the most that I am prayed for have been small groups. Nothing has changed my life than being involved in small groups. We have friends that are now all across the United States from when we were in our 20s. We have friends from our 30s, and they, we, still, we still connect because we know the spirit of each other. And I know I have people all over, and it is, that's all I'll say, but man, get involved in a small group or start one. Start one. Remember our verse that we looked at from Ephesians 6.18, stay alert, not only for ourselves, but also for our persistence in prayers for other people. This tells me that we need to be actively praying specifically for other people, but it also tells me that I will never outgrow my need for people to pray for me. I will never outgrow my need to humbly say, I'm not doing well. I need prayer. I need support. Another lesson that I feel like Chloe and, and us got from this was um, as a little girl, one of Chloe's phrases that she learned, one of her first phrases was, I can do it. 
I can do it. And in our family, we still say it just like that. If we're doing something, I'll be like, I can do it. And we all just know that was a Chloeism, um, which is awesome. And it has made her, allowed her to do incredible things. She has a can do attitude. It is awesome. But the flip side of that is that she has a hard time asking for help. And this was a huge lesson for her to get vulnerable and say, I can't do it all. I need other people and I need their prayer. And what did God do? He provided somebody that had different tools, that had knowledge that she didn't have, and he also showed up. He showed up and was right there with her. So we're getting ready for my last snake slide. So for those that want to shut your eyes, go ahead, and we will go exactly to the day, one month later. This is Chloe walking alongside the road, and she sees a dead snake. And as soon as she saw it, she just felt like the Holy Spirit dropped this. And this was the text that she sent to our family. Christ will always crush the head of the serpent, as it says in Genesis 3.15, which is the first prophecy of Christ's coming. The devil is defeated, and he always will be. Let's go, God. We can go ahead and take that off for people that don't want to open their eyes again. That, no matter what we experience or how we feel, and again, it wasn't like life's problems just evaporated for her. But she felt a new strength in the midst of them. And no matter the feelings that we have, we have a truth that we can stand on. And that is Jesus is with us. And he will always walk us through and will not leave us. And he has already defeated the enemy who hates us. Luke 10, 19 says, Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over the power of the enemy, nothing shall hurt you. I want to go back to the sermon, John Chrysostom. That last part really captured me, and it was learn and avoid the devil's stratagems so that after obtaining victory over him, we may, whether in this present life or in that which is to come, be proclaimed conquerors and obtain those unallied blessings. So I want to give you my takeaways. The first was be alert. Just keep in step with the Holy Spirit, praying daily. I'm asking him questions all the time. I never used to about four or five years ago, and, and I've had people push back at different things. I'm sorry. If I can't ask the Holy Spirit where you are, where are you right now in this situation? If you don't, like, I, that's how I'm living. Like, when, when I'm in the midst of something and I don't know what to do, I want my go-to to not be my reactions. I just want to respond with the Holy Spirit of God. And so what that is training me is to say, Holy Spirit, like I'm not saying it typically aloud, um, but I'm typically saying, Holy Spirit, what do you want me to do? Hold my mouth, hold my mouth, because I'm getting ready to really blast, because I'm a reaction type of person, and he's pulling me back. He's pulling me back. And he's like, right now, you just need to pray. You just need to pray. You just need to touch. You just need to whatever. That's how I'm doing this. I don't know if, you know, like, start talking to the Holy Spirit and listen for him, praying daily, letting our good shepherd lead us and guide us. If we want to grow, which I think that's why we're all here, how are you going to be intentional? Because just like we can't come once a week to eat and think that's going to satisfy us for the rest of the week, we also go home and we make our own or we go out and it's the same thing spiritually. You got you to get more than just today. Another thing is to learn and avoid 
Learn what the devil is up to, not in a hooky spooky way where you start getting messed up with all of that, but go to the word. Second Timothy 3, 16 through 17 says, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us also realize what is wrong with our lives. Shows us where we're letting him in. It connects us to when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it, and he's talking about the word of God, to prepare and equip for every good work. Do I realize my need for the body of Christ? My prayers for others matter, and I need to be sure that I am showing up to care and to support them, but also that I need their prayers, your prayers, your support, your strength, when I'm feeling weak. Isolation is a beautiful strategy of Satan, keeping you separate so nobody knows that you are maybe crashing. People can't see you. They don't know. They won't ask questions. You, you know, it, we get in our head. We all do. And the last strategy, or the last thing that my takeaway is go to the good shepherd. I just finished a seven-week series on Psalm 23. Oh, so amazing what we have learned. He can always be trusted. He will provide the tools that are needed for everything. He shows up equipped. We just have to see where he's coming from and who he's coming through. So here's some questions for you. Is there a snake in your bed? What are your strategies for fighting off the enemy of your soul that hates you? He's trying to steal, kill, and destroy. Is your strategy rooted and grounded in Scripture? Because that's where the power is, not in what we think is going to float. It's got to be the Word of God. Or are you trying, I can do it, method? How's that working? Because typically, it's only a matter of time before we crash. We all need the body. So what I want to share as this closing scripture is James 4, 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So here's a very practical aspect. And like I said, I want you to take this And keep letting it stir in you. And one of the best ways I know to do this is to immediately talk to someone about the sermon. And I totally get, like, I'm, you know, what do they say Sunday afternoons? You can roast whoever did the speaking that day or whatever. You're having Sunday roast. Um, Whatever. Like, is this stirring something in you? Is there something that maybe you like immediately thought of like, wow, I wonder if this has anything to do with X, Y, Z. Is this something that you've never even heard before? Because it's not as comfortable, and I get that. These are not popular messages, but the point is to be equipped. The point is to be strengthened. The point is to be encouraged. It says you're not the only one who's going through difficult times. Show up for other people and let people show up for you. So here's my challenge. And I don't know, I might just ask you because I'm seeing you people and if I see you over this next week, I might just say, so did you do this? Start by sharing with someone what thoughts this message has stirred in you. Here's my challenge. Let that be what you talk about over over lunch today. Did this stir anything? Are you do you have more questions? Is what is God saying? This is how we begin to take the word and to connect it into everyday life. So let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this opportunity. And Lord, I know that this was a bit different than what we normally do. But I pray that every single person here would be somehow strengthened and encouraged 
by your Holy Spirit. I thank you, Father God, that you provide all that is needed. I thank you, Father, that your word in Psalm 119 tells us the unfolding of your word brings light and understanding even to the simple. And God, that's me, simple. And I thank you, Father, for your provision. Lord, I pray that we would learn how to stand on the word of God and let it impact our lives as we reflect you to people all around us. In your precious name, we pray. Amen.